Hi, everyone. Welcome. We'll just give it a second for people to log on before we uh, get started. All right, I think in the interest of time, we will go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone to another PSTP application webinar series for the 2023-2024 year. Uh, my name is Carrie Jansen. I'll be your moderator for the evening. I'm M I'm an M4 at Emory um, University and the MSCP here in Atlanta. Um, we also have Jenny Jin, who's a G1 at Columbia's MSCP, who will be moderating our chat box and running the back end of things today on the tech side. Um, today's session, we have an all-star panel of current residents, um, as well as internal medicine, PSTP director, Dr. Patrick Hugh from Vanderbilt. Um, and to start off, um, we'll go around and have our panelists introduce themselves. Um, and we can, and I'll just call on each of you by name so we don't kind of Zoom, uh, <laughs> Zoom jinx each other. Uh, so we can start with Matt. Hey, can you hear me okay? Yeah, so uh, I'm Matt Madden. I'm at Yale now, uh, first year uh, in clinical pathology only. So pathology, but only like the lab side of it, research track. Uh, I completed the MSDP at Vanderbilt and worked with Jeff Rathnell looking at tumor amino metabolism. Excited to uh, talk to you all today. And next we'll do Lizzie. Hi everyone. Um, also PGY uh, two at Van uh, went to Vanderbilt for my MSTP and now at Penn doing psychiatry research track um, neuroimaging research. Allison. Hi everyone. I'm Allison Fitzgerald. I got my MD PhD from Georgetown studying uh, cancer immunology and pancreatic cancer, and I'm currently a PGY one and I am at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And Hannah. Hi, I'm Hannah. I got my MD PhD from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. I studied uh, renal disease and vascular biology and preeclampsia. And now I'm a PGY3 at the University of Michigan in otolaryngology, uh, working on my first grant uh, studying wound healing over 3D printed implants for craniofacial reconstruction. Uh, last but not least for the trainees, Drew. Hey, good evening, everyone. My name is Joe Banke. I'm a former classmate of Carrie's. Uh, I did my MD PhD training at Emory University. Uh, my PhD was in neuroscience. Um, I'm at a small community hospital in uh, central New Jersey, uh, Capital Health for my transitional year. And then I'll be heading to uh, Penn for my diagnostic radiology training um, in July. Patrick, Dr. Hugh. Uh, thanks, Carrie. I'm Patrick Hu. I got my MD and PhD from NYU about 30 years ago, and uh, I now direct the internal medicine PSTP at Vanderbilt. Awesome. So before Dr. Hu gives us an overview of um, interviewing and wrinkles from the program uh, perspective uh, for PSTPs, um, just to let you guys know, if you have any questions that come up at any time, feel free to go ahead and put them in the Q&A function. And we'll either answer them out loud or um, some of our panelists may answer you um, in the um, chat box as well. Um, but for now, let's go ahead and start with our overview from Dr. Hume. You're muted, Dr. Hume. Still haven't figured it out three and a half years in. Um, uh, a, a disclaimer, uh, which is that this is the opinion of one PSTP director of an internal medicine PSTP, but uh, I'm hopeful that I can provide some transparency 
the bottom line is it's important for you to ask uh, all of the questions that you need to ask at every program um, you interview at. Okay, so first of all, what are PSTP directors looking for? This is taken from a survey of primarily P uh, internal medicine and pediatrics PSTP directors. This is the reference. Emily Gallagher is the first author, and so this was published last year in JCI Insights. Um, the bottom line is uh, for medicine, PSTP uh, directors were primarily focused on the research, and so, so that's what we're going to be assessing. We want to know whether you have the track record in research, the passion for, uh, and, and the enthusiasm to pursue a research-based career long-term. But PSTP directors are only one uh, of the people uh, who, are in, who are involved in evaluating your application. And so what's important for you, wherever you're interviewing, is to figure out who is involved in the evaluation process. And so obviously, the PSTP director is going to be involved. The categorical program director, uh, director is going to be involved because you're spending at least two years in residency. And then if the program essentially guarantees you a fellowship slot, the, the subspecialty division chief and the fellowship program director are also likely going to be involved in your evaluation. And so your goal is to thread the needle so that you satisfy everything that they're looking for. And these people are frequently frequently looking for different things, okay? And so this is also taken from the same paper from Emily Gallagher. Um, if you look at what different programs do with regard to evaluation, it's uh, kind of all over the map, right? So for medicine PSTPs, um, we have about a third where the PSTP director and the residency program director are the main evaluators. And then another third where the fellowship program director is also involved. And then another third where all four people are involved. So it, it's so you should ask up front and you should ask the PSTP director who's going to be involved in evaluating my application. Um, essentially, whoever's involved, it usually, I mean, certainly it's the case here at Vanderbilt. Uh, and my sense is that it's also this way uh, elsewhere. If one person says no, then that's going to be a no for you. Okay, so you need to get a yes from all the people who are involved. This is how we select our applicants for interviews. So I get to see the applications first. Keep in mind that at some programs, the categorical program director sees the application first, okay, and, and filters based on what the categorical program director is looking for. So I evaluate for essentially scientific qualifications. And uh, if uh, your application passes passes muster, then I pass you along to our categorical program director. Another thing that's important uh, in this process is what is the relationship between the PSTP director and the categorical program director? And so it's important that these two people get along and are willing to provide some give and take. Okay. Um, it turns out that uh, John McPherson, our categorical program director, uh, he was my senior resident when I was an intern in the NICU. So we go back way uh, we go back a long ways. Um, if Dr. McPherson also says yes, then we pass your name on to division chiefs and fellowship program directors, and they will give the ultimate yes or no for the interview. Uh, generally, for the interview, we want to cast a relatively wide net. So if there's any doubt, we'll usually invite you. You have to know your interviewer. These are just my impressions about what people are looking for, but I'm looking for a strong scientific track record, and I'm looking to assess your potential for success as an independent investigator. Now, the categorical program director is not looking for that, nor is the fellowship program director. They are looking for clinical skills. So you have to make sure you convey to them that you're strong clinically and that you are able to handle the demands of the residency or of the clinical fellowship program. The, you know, the clinical training in pulmonary critical care is tough, right? So it's it's a lot of NICU. Uh, the cardiology services are busy. The hemoc services are busy. The other thing that they're going to want is they're going to want you to convince them that you're a team player because it is a team sport. 
for us at Vanderbilt, where we use our program, where the department uses the program as a farm team for developing future physician scientists faculty, the division chief is thinking about you as a potential future faculty member, okay? So that person wants to make sure that you're committed to that subspecialty and that you have scientific interests that align with what that person's picture of the division is. Again, this is specific to Vanderbilt, but, but you want to try to figure out what each person wants at each program you're interviewing at. Um, I'm going to, this is a figure that's taken from a paper uh, co-authored, I, I am on this, but Chris Williams is the first author. This came out in eLife just about a month and a half ago. So I would encourage you to take a look at this. Um, uh, if you uh, interviewed Vanderbilt, you will know, or have interviewed, you will know that when I introduce our program to our applicants, I do so in the context of questions that I think uh, all of the applicants should be asking at every interview. And the questions in this paper essentially mirror that. So I would encourage you to take a peek at that if you have a chance. Uh, a couple of pieces of uh, information. Uh, in, this pertains, this is data from our applicants, but uh, I believe it extrapolates nationwide uh, in internal medicine. So this is showing you five uh, recent application years on the x-axis and the percentage of applicants who are interested in specific subspecialties. And so they're color coded. I think the key ones for you to pay attention to are here, blue, light blue, hemonc, and orange cardiology. So over the past five years, I would say about 30 to 35% of our applicants wanted to do hemonc and about 20 to 25% wants to do cardiology. And so you need to keep that in mind. Many programs will rank their applicants agnostic to subspecialty interest, but we do not. So we take subspecialty interest into, into account because we want to spread the trainees across the different subspecialties in internal medicine. And so if the program does take subspecialty interest into account, you need to be aware of that because in that case, the people you are competing against are, prior, are the cardiology folks and the hemoc folks, okay? And so the other thing that means is that if you're applying an allergy and immunology, then you're gonna be a pretty strong candidate because nationwide, there aren't very many of you, right? Um, all academic medical centers want to recruit more physician scientists. And so if you happen to be interested in allergy immunology, uh, endocrinology, nephrology, rheumatology, then you are going to be a strong candidate, okay? You will just you will be just a strong candidate if you're interested in cardiology and hemoc, but you're gonna be competing with a lot more people at the institutions that take subspecialty interest into account. And the, the last slide I have here is just showing you how we structure our rank list. And so essentially we conduct this like the NFL draft. Uh, before I assemble the list, I go through and ask how many physician scientist trainees are in the pipeline in each subspecialty. And so this is what it looks like right now for us. And so the subspecialty that has the fewest number of trainees, that subspecialty gets to pick first, okay? And then the next subspecialty picks second, et cetera. And so what I do before assembling the rank list is I will meet with each division chief and fellowship program director, and we'll go over all of the candidates in that subspecialty, and they'll tell me who they want to rank and in what order. And once I have all of that information, I will start filling them in. And so the top allergy immunology candidate gets ranked first. And the top nephrology candidate gets ranked second, et cetera. And then we keep doing various rounds. So number two in allergy immunology ends up being our 10th ranked person. Number two, nephrology, 11th, okay? And so on until we, uh, we get to the bottom of each division's list. And so, for example, this is so obviously this is fluid right now because we've only um, conducted one interview session. But this year in endocrinology, we had we're only interviewing two applicants. And so we know we're not going to rank more than two in endocrinology. And so that will end up affecting uh, how many people we end up ranking. So to summarize, remember, every PSTP is different. Ask as many questions as you need to to get the information you need. 
Try to find out who's involved in the, in the decision-making process at each program. Make sure you know who you're interviewing with and what that person is looking for. And uh, the last couple of tidbits, so I would uh, encourage all of you to reach out to your number one ranked program and tell them that you were ranking them number one. Do not be deceptive about this. So several years ago, someone told me that he was ranking us number one and we ranked him and he didn't match at Vanderbilt's. And I remember who that is. So the world of academic medicine continues to get smaller as you get older. So don't piss any people off. Um, and I would go ahead and convey interest to programs that are pretty high on your list. And in particular, if you're uh, if you're applying in internal medicine, cardiology or HEMOC, uh, you should definitely do so. All right, I think we'll open up for questions then and I'll maybe start with a, a pre-submitted one while people are percolating on that information. I think a common question that we got, um, which I think uh, builds on Dr. Hu's suggestions about questions to ask um, at the programs, but maybe from the trainee perspective, what's, what kinds of questions were you asking in your interviews or in the socials um, to help you get a good sense of programs, especially over Zoom? Um, and how did you use that or your experiences uh, to try to decide between which programs uh, you ended up ultimately ranking highly? I'm happy to jump in. Um, one piece of advice that I got, which I can't take credit for, but I will pass along is um, pay attention to the people who succeed in the program. So if you are talking to a uh, research person, a clinical person, and like a department chair and a bunch of different people, and you say like, can you give me an example of somebody who's done well in your program? And they all give you the same person. That's a bit of a red flag that they are only propping up like a couple individuals and it's not like a, a great growth environment for everybody who comes through um, because a lot of programs have support for like their superstars but like there's lots of people who come through and in it's good to find programs that are flexible about like everybody who comes through and um, so one one thing that I found where I ended up is that there's like lots of different versions of success and lots of different types of people who have succeeded here um, and so that was a, a really telling thing that I um, found throughout the interview trail. I can give a couple of examples. Uh, I have one that's more specific to somebody seeking a, a research path in surgery and then one that I tell everybody to ask about, at least in, in ENT and surgery. Um, so in terms of research, it's there aren't a lot of specialized research tracks in uh, surgery and in an ENT. There are some that will have a position supported by uh, what used to be the T32 mechanism is now the R25 mechanism, um, but there aren't specific programs for that. So it's it can be hard to figure out which programs will have significant support for research time. So you really wanna, you know, it sounds sort of abrupt, but you really want to ask point blank what sort of resources they're devoting to support you in your research. Uh, because it can be very hard to do research in a surgical residency and you want a program that's going to provide not only time, but, you know, support from faculty, uh, support with resources to help you apply for grants, um, you know, faculty who have labs that you can use if you need space like that, um, statistical support, things like that. So you really want to ask uh, very specifically about what resources they're committing to help you. And then one thing that I tell everybody to ask about is uh, call schedule in ENT and surgery. A lot of people will um, sort of uh, suggest that you don't ask about that because you know, you're gonna be on call a lot everywhere. Uh, but I really find that that determines a lot of your quality of life. And there's a lot of difference in the way that programs structure their call. Um, so if you have preferences about that, um, I would say you probably should develop some preferences about that. And that's a good thing to, to ask about because that's going to be a big part of your life. And specifically whether or not you are required to take call during that research time. I'll add some things for me that were a factor is um, some like concrete data, which was the percentage of K awards 
Um, so K's are like the transition awards to go from basically launched to being an independent investigator. And so I think it was kind of um, going off of what's been said, but it's kind of a concrete way to assess a program's commitment to their students. Of course, not everybody can get a K who applies. So there's you know some outlying factors there, but overall, I feel like it was a good indication of like which programs are taking their support of their PSTPs very seriously. Um, and not just in terms of like what percentage of people who applied for a K got it, but also um, how many people applied. So there's one program who had like 75% success rate, but only four people had applied. So it's like, okay, well, you know, that's probably not some great stats. Um, and then also, I think for me, a big factor, this is more for I am focused, if you're going to do a fellowship, um, is for me, a lot of the residency programming was very similar from program to program, but the fellowship um, training was a little different. But what was the most different was the support that programs gave for the transition from fellowship to independent investigator. And so a lot of programs had a lot of different approaches to this. And to the state, I don't think anybody knows what the best approach is, um, but some programs like uh, had additional funding, um, that they could give to applicants. Some programs had grants, like internal grants you could apply for. Um, some programs had like basically super fellow positions where you would be a fellow for two additional years. Some programs automatically promoted you to instructor. Um, so those are, to me, those are some really important um, differentiators between programs um, to try to best launch you into a academic career as an independent investigator. And then the last thing, of course, is personal factors. So where you're going to live, um, you need support near you um, to like best set up your both career, but also your personal life because PSTPs are just like MD PhDs, very long training programs. So you want to make sure you're happy where you end up going. All right. Um, another question um, that we've that's been commonly asked is um, how did you guys prepare for talking about like next steps um, in your research especially when talking to research track programs um, what did you know how did you balance uh, the kind of dance between talking about what you've done and what the follow-ups from that are and melding that with uh, you know being in another person's lab in your next stage of training for me I got a lot of questions about you know, what sort of role do I want research to play in my future career? Because uh, I was interviewing with a very mixed bag of, uh, you know, surgeons who sort of are only clinical and then surgeon scientists at some of the bigger institutions. Uh, so they really wanted to know how I was planning to put those pieces together. And I found it best to be very honest and say, you know, I'm looking for a program that will help me figure that out, that will give me the support to figure out how I can balance those two things in my career and sort of explore different types of research that I haven't been exposed to. Um, and I, I found that that at least worked very well for me and was for me a very honest answer. You know, this is not something that you can sort of put up a good front about because whatever program you wind up at, you know, you don't want to sort of go back on things that you said because folks will remember. I had people come back and talk about things that I talked about in my interview, you know, even last year and this year. So, so people remember, so don't spin a tale that really, really sounds good. That uh, isn't true to yourself and, and the hopes that you have for your career. Yeah, I would absolutely echo always be yourself. Number one rule when interviewing, always be yourself. Um, for myself, so I came, I have immunology background, I have metabolism background, cancer background. I don't know if I want to do metabolism or cancer moving forward. I really want to do immunology moving forward. So that's what I said. And I said that, you know, you can spin that a good way because like I feel good about the expertise I have in cancer and metabolism. And maybe I would use that to help differentiate myself from my potential PI who's for my postdoc mentor later on when I start my own lab. Um, and ultimately the decisions I make about which lab I joined for my postdoc are going to be based on the questions of who do I vibe with the best? The, 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 the most critical choice for me professionally right now is whose lab I join for the sake of my career, right? That's how I, I view this. And so that selection of mentor is going to be super critical. Um, that, and that's what I prioritize. 
I think also you need to be explicit about, I need to join somebody's lab who will, you know, let me take whatever I do with me um, as a very explicit thing as you try to start your own lab up. Um, and I think that's something that you can just be very, very explicit about in your desire to be a physician scientist or, you know, whatever your, your, your goals are. So, yeah, I think just being yourself though, and being honest, um, is the easiest path to go and just the most enthusiastic version of yourself. As Patrick hinted at, you don't know who you're talking to. Do they care about your clinical skills? Do they care about your research skills? Um, no matter what. Just be enthusiastic and the best version of yourself, and you'll be fine, um, I think is the bottom line. Yeah, to sort of echo that, I think you want to convey your passion for science uh, in the discussions that you have. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't really matter what it is you're going to study in the future, just as long as you have a passion for whatever it is, and that you're, um, you know, looking to advance whatever field you're going into. Um, I think it's, uh, been said oftentimes when choosing a PhD advisor at the end of the day, it's not the, the like exact science that you're studying day to day, but about the mentorship and the tools that you're given so that you can address any question you want to address in the future. Um, and so I think that still is applicable here. And I would even, you know, I'm, I'm maybe a little naive on this, but if you go to an institution that's not studying the exact protein you want to study or whatever it may be that you want to study, maybe that's an opportunity with your PhD skills or your prior research skills to start something brand new at that institution. And then that segue into a junior faculty position might, might even be more fruitful because you're, you're not competing with someone locally uh, who's doing the same thing you're doing. And to like continue this, agree with everyone, be honest about what you're interested in. Um, what I would actually do is before the interview, I would go to NIH reporter and I would look at all of the R01 funded grants. And I would look at the investigators and try to imagine if any of my research interests would fit within not that exact project, but those techniques or the lab or like the greater picture and try to envision if there was actually investigators there, ideally more than one, that you would be interested in their research. Um, and so that was a way for me to kind of try to, ahead of the interview, conceptualize if this institution was a good research fit for me personally. I think Hannah has mentioned some of these in the chat already, but we've gotten similar questions quite a few times. Can you guys speak to um, how you decided to rank uh, PSCP and categorical programs at the same institution? Uh, and maybe rolled into this because um, we do have kind of a variety also, if you whether you're deciding for medicine or peds people, uh, if you were going somewhere where a fellowship was guaranteed or not, um, and how, how you kind of decided to rank institutions and, and different tracks within the same institution. I can start this one off again and cover the, the other question that's currently in the Q&A. Uh, I applied to primarily categorical spots. Uh, I did rank the Mich Michigan research track because they sort of allow you to, to decide after the interview, really, they because they submit the same rank list for, for both tracks. Uh, and I really wanted to be at Michigan. Um, but the way that I talked about that in my interviews was that I felt very strongly in my research background and felt that that would give me a good leg up to sort of hit the ground running and um, get a good pro um, get a good project together in the time that I was given without having that extra year for research, which is really uh, how most of the surgery programs see it. They sort of reserve those research tracks for folks who don't have a strong research background and want to learn how to do research. So they say they see somebody coming in with like a PhD or really strong research background as more of a prime candidate for the categorical spots because you have all of this background knowledge of how to do that. So there's um, strong support, at least in surgery, for MD, PhDs or other physician scientist trainees to take those categorical spots. Um, and I think that answers the one question. And then in terms of ranking, uh, like I said, I did rank the Michigan research track, you know, sort of right behind the Michigan categorical, primarily because I knew that I that this was the program for me and I wanted to be here regardless of whether it took five or six years. 
Uh, and that was, it was really a location that worked for my family as well. So don't forget to include those sort of factors. If location is important to you for family reasons, for local support reasons, for other reasons in terms of establishing yourself in your career and your life moving forward, don't let that, uh, don't let, you know, this push to do research um, sort of push you away from doing the categorical categorical program because this is your life uh, and the rest the beginning of the rest of your life so uh, rank according to your values I think kind of jumping on that I um, definitely agree with everything that you just said um, for folks who are not applying to like the more traditional PSTP type specialties so so for psychiatry there's a lot of programs that are growing their research tracks um, as more and more physician scientists are interested in psychiatry um, and so there are many programs that will say if you are a research heavy candidate and you want to be on the research track and you don't match to the research track we will make you a research track resident once you're here and so there's many programs that have a lot of flexibility just because resources are pouring into physician science training in psychiatry and so for those types of programs that like were explicitly clear then you can easily rank them back to back because you have good evidence that you could go into either and you'd still be a research track candidate. And then there's others who are like, no, our, our 25 spots are the only spots. And if you get one of those, you get one. And if you don't, you don't. And then those ones I rank separately. Um, so I think it for a program that might be a little bit less um, definitive, like I know the PSTPs in medicine are quite set up, but um, psychiatry is a little bit more flexible because it's just growing so rapidly. I'll say for medicine, I ranked entirely PSTPs and then categorical. For sure, my priority was PSTP over categorical. Um, actually, the only categorical program that I ranked was the one I ended up at. Um, and it's, again, like Hannah said, was for personal reasons that, you know, geography was ended up being a really, really important factor for me. Um, and then also, not to get into the details, but this program, you can still short track um, and so they're still basically you build your own PSTP. It's a little harder, um, but that was my approach. Doctor, you have um, alluded to this already, um, but how did you guys approach um, post interview communications from the trainee perspective? Um, and Doctor, if you have anything you want to add that you didn't say already, please feel free. I, uh, I would just say, so to Dr. Who's point, where once you're done interviewing and you know for sure who your number one is, once you know for sure, don't do it and then switch, switch your mind. But once you know for sure who your number one is, totally tell them, like absolutely tell them. Um, that's like a no brainer. That, that, that definitely is the best way to go. I think, uh, and I know the rules are different for everything, but if when people reached out to me, about like, oh, hey, you know, hope you had a good time interviewing here. I would say, oh, of course I did. It was terrific. And I'll let you know if I have any questions. So it's all very positive, right? You're not like, oh, you're my second choice. Or like, oh, you're my, you know, don't do that. But just be positive and be like, hey, you know, like, yeah, it's all, it's all good. Um, but that number one spot, just tell them that. And uh, so it, from a fellow applicant who applied in pathology research track. I know somebody who told the place that they were their number one and that place let them know you're not ranked to match. So that person was able to then reach out to another program and say, hey, now you're my number one. And so it, it actually very much changed their trajectory. And they're now at a place that's equally amazing as what their other number one had been. So I think that there can be real uh, benefits and with explicit communication in certain situations. I know Dr. Who probably has, he knows the rules more. For, from my understanding, the rules are don't ask any questions, but you can offer up any information that you potentially have. Yeah. Right. So Matt, to, just a question about that. So, so your, your colleague who did that, if the, if he, if that person wasn't ranked to match, that person still might've been ranked highly enough to match there. Right. It's because, possible. Because, so you know, we, we we have eight slots, but we 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 know we're going to go way below eight, right? Because not our our top eight aren't all going to rank as number one. 
my understanding for clinical pathology only match is it's only maximally six spots and that's like by far the largest and so essentially it's pre-arranged before match day and everyone effectively knows where they're going in february okay. and it's all okay. kind of behind the scenes yeah okay okay i see um for for internal but you're right so what matt said is correct so uh so no one should be asking you where you are ranking them that is a match violation okay i i think that is done but that is a match violation and so you're so you're not required to say anything um it, it's so we don't reach out to people after we interview them but i always tell people if you have questions that you want answered or if you want to if you want us to connect you with a faculty member you didn't get to meet up with then by all means you know we want to do that because finding a, a good research mentor is probably the number one priority for you if you're applying to a research track program and so we want to maximize the chances that that'll happen um what we're doing now is so so given that everything is virtual at the beginning we recognize that people need to so if people haven't visited Nashville or Vanderbilt, they really need to come see it to, to make an informed decision. And so what we did last year for the first time was we held a second look visit. And what we did was to ensure that it was non-evaluative, we, um, we made up our rank list and locked it. And then the next day we invited all of the people who were ranked to come visit Nashville. And so that so that way so we couldn't change anything so already those people were ranked right so um, that way they could come knowing that whether they came or not was gonna was not gonna affect how they were ranked. Um, at, at Michigan, we do something very similar. I think a, a big green flag to talk about green flags rather than red flag is programs who are very open about the way that they do things. Uh, like Dr. Who said, um, Michigan is very open about the fact that they don't do any post-interview communication. Uh, I think we send out like a little newsletter just about things that are going on in the department, but we don't engage in any other post-interview communi communication. Like even if, you know, the trainees send emails, they don't respond. Uh, and they're very open about the fact that we complete our rank list the night of the interview. We do two interview days and our rank list is, is done after that second interview day. So really nothing that you send after that will affect the rank list. It is effectively locked. Uh, so programs who are very open about the way that they, you know, are, are making those decisions, I think is a very positive thing. And at least for me, made a very positive impact on me. Uh, we're also doing a similar thing where we're locking our rank list and then doing a second look this year. Uh, that is new for us this year. Uh, but our, as a as a specialty, our group of program directors strongly encourage sort of following those match rules and and not providing you know rank information to trainees. Uh, so I think I can't, obviously can't speak for every program, but um, I think uh, by far as a specialty, there's very very limited post-interview communication because it, it is a very small world. Uh, so if you say you're my number one to more than one program director, people are going to talk. Uh, maybe for those of you that aren't in a dedicated, sorry, Allison, did you have more to add on that? I was just going to say, I think that uh, the Vanderbilt system, which is the best system, only exists at Vanderbilt. I think the other second looks, um, there was not a pre-locked uh, rank list. So that's just to put that out there. Um, and then the other thing was definitely for your number one, tell them that they're number one. But for like my top probably four programs were the programs that I went to do second looks at. And I think that, you know, of course for Vanderbilt, it's locked, so it doesn't make a difference. But um, those other programs, I mean, it obviously shows that you actually are like very interested if you're willing to take the time to go and see the place in person and meet people. Um, and so I think, of course, never tell them that someone's your number one if they're not, but it's a way to show that you're actually very interested in that program. Along those lines, if you are interested in a program as one of your top programs and they don't have the formal second look, how did you guys go 
about uh, doing that if you did visit. I know for me personally, I was actually very honest in my interviews and I was just like, I would say like, I'm actually very interested in your program. <laughs> um, and then I, I just wouldn't say that in the, in the, in the, for programs that I actually wasn't as interested in. And I would give the reasons why I was so interested in that program. Um, and so for like my research interests specifically, they're not as broad as some other programs. So there are some institutions where I was like, I'm actually very interested in this um, because your institution would be great for me to attend. Um, and I just didn't say that to the programs that didn't align with me as well. Um, so for you, those of you who aren't in a formalized PSTP or research track, um, how are you going about kind of carving out time um, for research related things? Are you waiting until like a later stage? Uh, what does that roadmap um, on the physician scientist's life look like for you? In surgery, you use whatever time you have. <laughs> um, no, I, I, there's a strong, um, emphasis in surgery programs that at least for those of us with a research background, like you, you have that research background, you have to focus on being a good surgeon because it's not just about knowledge. It's about, you know, your tangible skill. So while we also emphasize research, you know, it's highly supported to, to step back for a year or two years, um, and work on honing your skills. Um, because that's the, the other part of the puzzle that's very, very important. Um, so I did that for my first and second years. Our second year is pretty rigorous because we take more of our primary call then. Um, so I decided to spend those two years just fo focusing on building my skills, building my knowledge. Um, and then this year is when we're required to apply for a core grant. And research requirements like that um, aren't necessarily important from the standpoint of them being requirements. But if a program is going to require you to do things, at least to me, that's a sign that they're willing to commit re resources to help you because if they're going to make that sort of compulsory, uh, there has to be a mechanism to support you in doing that. So um, that's what I've been working on recently. And so I've been focusing a little more effort uh, on uh, preparing for that, preparing to, you know, do some experience, experiments, get back in the lab with the uh, 20 or so weeks that I have dedicated next year um, to actually do that research. The only things that I did sort of in the past couple of years, I wrote a couple of uh, sort of case reports or other sort of, you know, short little clinical papers. I can quickly comment on radiology. Radiology, obviously, there's a ton of research going on. You hear about AI like every day. Um, in terms of structured uh, residency programs that incorporate research opportunity, there are five, last I checked, um, that have both a sort of categorical track um, or just pure clinical track and then um, a, a research track. And so you can rank both of them. Um, but uh, in terms of, uh, and, I, and at Penn uh, is, Penn is one of the programs that has a dedicated research track. I'm actually on the clinical track. Um, but what is great uh, about Penn is that I get half a day a week um, for academic time uh, for the first three years. Then in, in the fourth year of training, uh, I can I can take a, a bunch of research um, elective time. I think it, it starts at the drawing board when you're considering programs. You have to be honest and ask them what kind of, it, this was already ta talked about, but just to reinforce this, you have to ask about protected time, especially in the clinical specialties that are otherwise underrepresented um, in research. So there are more and more physician scientist pathways with um, you know the sort of non-traditional clinical specialties, but you have to ask that those those types of questions about dedicated research time. Every program is going to say, "Yeah, we love research, we support research," but until they can tell you or point exactly on you know within the curriculum that hey, we give you X amount of of dedicated time, you know you, you have to be honest. When you are try to talk to people who are in the program. Don't listen to people like me, because I'm going to tell you what you want to hear. Talk to people who are actually in the program. Yeah, I would say um, I agree 100% with what Joe said, specifically, like, where where is the research time? Um, and has it really protected or not? I will say, for the sake of clinical pathology, for anyone out there who's never heard about clinical pathology, first off, 
Uh, let me give a shout out to the Behind the Microscope podcast that Joe and Carrie and others have put together um, about science and being and medicine and being a physician scientist. If you go to many of those earlier episodes, a lot of CP only folks, clinical pathology folks, particularly from Emory, um, who are fantastic to listen to. But anyway, clinical pathology only, you don't really have to work very hard to have protected research time because there's 18 months of clinical work and that's kind of like eight to five. And then you have 18 months of residency where it's pretty much research time. And then they'll give you postdoc time. So um, it's a pretty sweet gig. And so now I'm coming around to, in the first half of my intern year, talking to postdoc mentors and being like, hey, like, what could I be doing in your lab? Like, what would that look like? What's the culture like? I'm going to come to a, some of your lab meetings. So it's, it's a different um, residency experience. You still will have a clinical expertise to offer and be useful for a clinical department, hematopathology, um, blood banking, chemistry, molecular. Um, there's a lot of things, microbiology. Think about it if you're undecided about what your clinical specialty is going to be. Um, but for me, that's how I approach research time is, it's not that hard for me in my particular circumstance. My uh, oh, sorry. sorry. No, I was going to say I might say something like goes a little against the grain, but for me personally, um, I'm not trying to integrate any research time right now because I am trying to short track and do internal medicine in two years, like many PSDP programs. And for me right now, my priority is my clinical training, especially in turn year. Um, so as of now, I'm not pursuing any research projects. If anything, the extent of my research integration is to just have casual meetings with potential mentors. Um, like over coffee for 30 minutes or an hour. Um, but otherwise, I do not intend to do any research during my first year of residency and maybe not even my second. Um, similarly to, to Matt, psychiatry has um, less than three years of um, ACGME requirements, but it's a four-year residency because of the longitudinal psychotherapy requirement that we have. And so because of that, you have at minimum like a year of time that is for every single resident. And so research track residents, it's almost entirely used for research. Um, and then programs that are uh, not using you for extra labor um, will only do 32 months of ACGM requirements and that's it. And so then, um, so I have a month, my intern year last year for research, I have three months this year. And then next two years, I have six months or, or I can do like three months and nine months or whatever you wanna do. Um, of more of like just solid protected time and that's it. So with psychiatry, um, it is also relatively straightforward. Thanks guys. Um, a little bit different kind of question. Uh, what advice would you would you guys give to an applicant who is interested in continuing on a physician scientist career path, but maybe has pretty general interests or doesn't know exactly what they want to do? Say they did like a pretty general PhD, and they, um, you know, they don't feel ready to pick a fellowship or a subspecialty area when they're starting out um, in the residency application phase and they like a variety of things. Um, is it okay to narrow down your interests later? What advice would you give them in the application process? Uh, I think I'll jump in on this one first. Um, most of our applicants do commit to a, a subspecialty, but um, there is, I think people are not necessarily aware. So the ABI and research pathway for people who are interested in subspecialty training is either six or seven years, depending upon what subspecialty you pick. But there is an approved five-year program, which involves uh, short tracking through medicine residency for two years, followed by going directly into the lab and doing your three years of protected research time. That is something that is worth considering especially for someone who hasn't decided what they want to do, because you can make a decision to apply to fellowship after you, you start internship, right? When you're a resident, you can make that decision. But what we know in the PSTP space, I think this applies to all subspecialties, is that number one, training is taking too long. And number two, that the, the point of greatest attrition is towards the end of training. When trainees uh, start to uh, be beset by uh, multiple competing pressures and priorities. 
So anything we can do to shorten the training time to get you to that career development award um, will uh, enhance retention and reduce attrition. Um, any thoughts on kind of the best question that you could have asked to get the best sense of the programs when you're interviewing? I think a lot of the, a lot of anxiety coming from applicants, as I'm sure all of the trainees on the call know, is uh, getting a sense of places virtually. Um, so what did you feel like your like highest yield question was that you asked programs to get a sense of, of, um, of fit while you weren't able to visit in person in your at least initial kind of visit? For me, I don't know if there was a specific question. It was sort of the combination of everything and sort of a gut feeling. Um, from, I think the most important thing to me was seeing how the residents interacted with each other uh, or how they talked about each other and because I really wanted to be a part of a program that was you know, pretty close. It was a small specialty. Our programs are pretty small. You're gonna be spending you know, the majority of your time with this small group of people. So I, I wanted it to be a, a team that I wanted to be a part of. And um, I ended up getting that. So follow your, your gut and your sense about, you know, if these people are your people. On, on a related note, um, you know, apply your scientific observation skills to this interview experience. Um, the things that really stood out to me were not the conversations, but the things that I saw. So one program had eight or nine uh, residents sitting around a table and you could tell they were like a family and, and it wasn't even what they were saying. It's just the fact that they came together on a weekday night to chat with us applicants. That meant uh, an enormous amount and it really still uh, stands out in my mind. Just the again the conversations that that the residents have how how they come off or you know are, do they sound stressed um, you can kind of pick up on on these nuances uh, the more interviews that you go on um, and I would really heavily weigh you know your gut instinct that that you uh, take away from those experiences. You should reach out to um, people from your school who are a few years ahead of you who are at the program even if you don't know them. So reach out to them because th that person will give you reliable information. One thing that I did, which um, I'm sorry, this is a little out of the scope because this is not related to the interview itself, but um, I went to two conferences in the uh, winter of the year I was applying and I basically like scoured the whole invite list and found every resident who was there, who was a psych resident and I met with them. Um, which uh, psychiatry, as I said, is pretty small. So there were not that many of them that might not work for like these huge uh, medicine conferences. But um, I met with like, I think six or seven residents from different programs at this conference in December of the year that I was applying. So it was like, hey, I just met you at this interview or I'm about to interview with your program. I'd love to hear about it. And that was a really cool way, um, not only to make it like a kind of extended interview process, but also just to get like a little bit more um, insider knowledge. I would add that I, I agree with the gut instinct. Even over Zoom, you'll have gut instincts. And one particular place I was like, oh, that was weird talking to those people. Like, I don't, you know, that's not good. Um, the, other, the other thing is if you can go in person, that's great. So for instance, uh, my interview at Yale was actually in person. So that was just by far and away better. Um, almost unfairly better compared to the virtual interviews, honestly. Additionally, what questions do you get asked, particularly if you have to give a research talk? For CP only, frequently you have to give a talk, right? And it's kind of like, oh, you've just done your thesis, you've done a PhD, so you just kind of cut that to the appropriate size. And then what are the questions that are being asked of you by faculty, by the residents, are they engaged? Again, thinking the clinical side versus the research side, that I think is very valuable. In addition, to all the interview questions you get, Right. But I, I, in particular, for me, I really wanted to focus on that, that science talk. Um, and then if you don't have the in-person interviews, uh, I think, you know, Patrick emphasized this, go in person to the place afterward 
even if there isn't a second look, if you can do that, do that and it reach out to the people. And, you know, there might be rules that, oh, we're not, we can't like engage with you or whatever, but if they can go intrude on their space and talk to them and be like, Hey, like what's going on around here? Can I come to your morning report if it's a medicine program or something like that? I think it's totally worth it. And you got to see where you're going to live uh, as well, I think. One last thing about trusting your gut. Don't only trust your gut about other residents, but also program leadership. I think you can tell a lot from Zoom about how involved program leadership is and how invested they are in their individual trainee success. Um, and it's pretty transparent, like which programs are really thinking critically about how to best support their trainees and which programs like have a PSTP because they're like competing institutions have a PSTP. So they want one to like look competitive. In the last couple minutes we have, uh, maybe if everyone could give um, their kind of parting advice for applicants, uh, current trainees, future applicants, uh, what's your best saved wisdom as um, current residents and uh, program leadership? I'll start. This might not be advice, but it will work out. I don't envy your position. Applying was incredibly stressful. Interviewing was incredibly stressful. Um, and I remember people saying to me, it'll all work out. And I was like, no, it won't, <laughs> but it will. Um, it'll be great. And you'll all do great. And if you have any questions, always reach out. I think a, a cognitive shift that can be helpful is thinking about um, these interviews, especially for research track, are like, the most incredible opportunity to meet with the people that you have been reading their papers and looking up to their work for like your entire thesis and just like all of your work. And then you have like this three month span where you just meet all of them and you get like one on one meetings with like for like half an hour, sometimes an hour in psychiatry because we just like to talk and you just get to like talk to these like idols and like everybody who's amazing in the field. And like, you'll never get to do that again. Like, even if you're applying for postdocs, even if you're applying for faculty, like you'll never get that kind of unfettered access to like the giants of your field. And so I would just think about like, even if you didn't like your interview or even if something goes wrong, like you have this incredible opportunity to meet with like these scientists that are doing incre incredible work like across the country. Like it's, it's a really cool time that I kind of am sad I'll never get to do again. <laughs> So um, along the lines of meeting people, so one thing that has been lost with the virtual interviews is the ability of you as an applicant to meet and interact with other applicants. So what we did to try to preserve that is at the end of our uh, interview program, um, uh, so I hold a Q&A for the last half hour, and then once that half hour elapses, I sign off and all of the interviewees stay on for half an hour and talk about our program behind our back because it is really important. I, I think it's super helpful and maybe Allison, you can speak to this, but I think it's, so, so first of all, you're gonna meet a lot of the same people over the course of the interview season. And so you're gonna actually get to know them pretty well. And I, I think, you know, getting their take on all the various programs um, will be very useful information to you as you make your decision. I think. Yeah, I'll echo that, that getting to know the other applicants, even I am, which was the biggest of the PSTPs, you see the same applicants at every single interview. By the end, you know all of them. Um, and it was so helpful. I actually, I would just message them on Zoom and be like, hey, this is the third interview I've seen you at. I'm Allison. This is my phone number. Let me know if you want to talk. And through that, I like was able to get in touch with a lot of people and we would all talk about, you know, different things and it ended up being really helpful. So I encourage you to, you know, it can be a little nerve wracking to like message on Zoom, um, but I did it all the time. And so I encourage you to reach out to people that you, you know, think it would be helpful to connect with. Oh, um, yeah. I can just add the process is stressful. If you're not feeling stressed, then something is wrong. Um, but 
once you hit that submit button on ERAS, you know, it's the rest is just, you know, talking to people, your body of work has already been sealed at that point. You've done all the heavy, you know, lifting and all that hard work. And now it's just, you know, an opportunity to have people, you know, talk to you. And, and uh, I would say like, try to stay in your lane. Don't get, you know, caught up with someone who has five nature papers, who's interviewing with you. You know, that is not competition. That's maybe a future colleague down the line. At the end of the day, we're all trying to, you know, help improve the lives of people. People are going to die, you know, no matter what we do. Um, we're, we're not going to have answers and solutions to everything we do. And uh, I think that's the basis for why we want to be, you know, physician scientists. And so just reinforce that in, in your minds when you're looking for motivation or when you're down. Uh, what we get to do every day is pretty amazing. So. I uh, remember that you're judging these programs too. It's not about them assessing you. It's you assessing the program to see if it's a place that you want to train. Uh, because remember, this is going to be a significant portion of your life, a significant amount of your time. And it's going to be one of the biggest influences in shaping your career. Uh, so you really want that to be the right program for you. Um, along those lines, rank according to your values and your priorities. Don't rank the way that you think, you know, you're, a program director wants you to rank or your parents want you to rank or your partner wants you to rank, uh, really be true to yourself and your gut values. And it, I promise it will work out. Uh, and then for my surgery folks speci specifically, go somewhere where people are excited about you. I interviewed at a lot of programs who were sort of confused uh, that an MD PhD student wanted to go into a surgical field and they really didn't know what to do with that. But um uh, at Michigan and at several other programs, people were really excited about it. They were excited to train me and to mentor me and to help me become the surgeon scientist that I want to be. So pick a place that is going to be excited about you. Um, and I'm always happy to talk to, to folks who are interested in applying to any surgical field. I have connections with, you know, pretty much every branch of surgery at Michigan and, and there are great surgeon scientists all over the place so I can I can get you the mentorship you need. Um, I'd like to chime in one uh, for one last comment. So we as directors uh, and as interviewers are not allowed to ask you anything about your personal situation. If you have a partner who needs uh, a job, please tell us because we cannot ask you about it. And we will do our best, you know, we will do our best to try to make that situation work. Yeah, I would, I would uh, just finally epic or, or echo what Hannah said, where it's like, know yourself and be genuine to what you want. Think about it and be like, oh, this is what I want with my life. Where do I want to live? What do I want to do with my career? Who do I want to work with? And that it streams it streamlines everything. And to Lizzie's point, where it's like, wow, this is amazing. We get to be targeting all these amazing investigators and clinicians. One person I talked to was like, oh, the interview trail. That's kind of like the victory lap. I don't know if it feels that way when you're doing it, but that's a nice reframe of what's going on. Like you get to go and talk to all these people. And everybody wants you, and you know you're evaluating them, getting to Hannah's point. So it can be a, a stressful, but still pleasant, I think, experience. Thank you all so much for sharing your evening with us and sharing all the wisdom that you've gathered over the years with us. Um, and thank you to our participants for a lot of great questions both ahead of time and live tonight. Um, the next installment of our PSTP application webinar series will be on Thursday, January 18th. So we'll have a little hiatus for the holidays and back in January. That will be in collaboration with the AMC TOPS, uh, great group TOPS group. Um, and that will be featuring six additional PSTP programs um, uh, including some um, less commonly discussed uh, physician scientist specialties and surgical specialties. So um, definitely look out for the, uh, the registration link for that in the coming weeks um, and check out our YouTube channel or APSA YouTube channel if you want to look at um, recordings of previous webinars, um, which will also be where this one is posted um, later on this month. Um, thanks again for everyone joining us and have a great rest of your evening.